Good morning and welcome to you. It's so good to be together with you again uh, today in worship, uh, in this service. And a very happy Valentine's Day to all of you. I plan to wear my bright pink clerical shirt this morning in celebration of this day, but sadly that is in the wash. So uh, sorry about that. But today is also Transfiguration Sunday. And that's the focus of our service today as we hear the story of how Jesus took Peter, James, and John up a mountain and was transfigured before them. It's the last Sunday in the season of Epiphany, and next Sunday we move into the season of Lent. And so um, that's our, our focus today, this final week in Epiphany as God opens our eyes to something new about himself. I want to read a call to worship based on the Transfiguration passage this morning. The mountain top, the shining face, the glowing clothes, the voice of God speaking from the cloud, the commandments etched in stone. Sometimes God shows up in ways we cannot deny, in a place we can go, a light we can see, a voice we can hear, a stone we can touch. Sometimes. Sometimes there is the veil, the overshadowing, terrifying cloud, the questions, the appearing and disappearing, the excitement, the wondering, the silence. Sometimes God shows up in ways we cannot deny. Always God shows up somehow. So we have shown up here. Now may God give us eyes to see. Amen. Our opening hymn tries to capture some of the glory that we see on top of the mountain as Jesus is revealed to his disciples. Uh, the hymn is Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
us pray. Lord, we confess that very often we grow so accustomed to your presence and your accessibility and we forget that we worship the God who is the Ancient of Days, the Eternal One, Immortal, Invisible. Thank you for the scriptures today which reorient us and remind us of your glory of your eternal being and nature. We pray that today, in this season of Epiphany, you would open our eyes to see something of your immensity, your omnipotence. We come to you trusting in your power today, Lord, and we bring our needs to you knowing that you are not removed from us, but care about the details of our lives. And so we bring the concerns that are uppermost in our minds, health concerns, financial concerns, worries about the uncertainty of tomorrow. And we bring them to the Ancient of Days and ask for your help. We ask that you would help our nation with the challenges that we face right now, economic and health and political, all the big questions that we seem to be grappling with as a people at the moment. We bring them to the Ancient of Days. We pray for our church community, for our witness in the world, for the families represented by all worshipping with us today. We pray that we would all know your presence today, that we would experience the peace that comes from God eternal. And that we would be strengthened as we meet with you on the mountaintop today and are sent out into the valley tomorrow to be your people in this world. We come offering our prayers, our songs, our gifts to you in this moment of worship, praying all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Two notices for you this morning. The first is a note from Joan Bredenkamp to say that there are still a couple of those Lenten devotional books available, that we have some extras in the office if you're interested in getting hold of one. They are 190 rand each, and you can contact Janet or Joan to um, order a copy if, you, if you're interested. And then second, because we are starting Lent, next Sunday is the first Sunday of Lent, that means that this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. And we did think a little bit about whether it would be possible to have a service with the, with the regular um, ashing of the, the ashen cross on people's foreheads, but probably the uh, COVID protocols uh, preclude me from touching 50 people's heads with my thumb. <laughs> so what we're going to do instead is try and do this online. Uh, last year, Ash Wednesday took place before the lockdown, so we haven't tried this before, um, although we're coming up to the one-year anniversary of these services. Um, and so on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, there will be a service, and you are invited if you would like. You don't have to do this, but if you'd like to prepare some ashes, all it takes is uh, burning some, some paper. Newspaper works fine. Um, what we traditionally use is the Palm Crosses from the previous year's uh, Palm Sunday service. Um, but uh, you can use whatever you need, and, and then normally mix it in with a little bit of oil. Um, any kind of oil is fine, just so that it um, helps to make a little paste that you can use to mark your forehead. And then in the service, you'll have a chance to mark the foreheads, put the little cross on the forehead of other people in the service with you, or even just to do your own um, as a sign of the beginning of this journey uh, into Lent. So if you'd like to um, prepare the ashes, and then also there will be a space in the service for communion. So we'll have a love feast, and you can bring along elements, um, grape juice and bread, or something similar, 
so that we can uh, remember this meal that Jesus commanded us to observe. So that's Wednesday at 6 o'clock. That service will be taking place. Also, of course, you could, you could uh, watch the video later on our YouTube channel. But if you join us uh, online um, at the live.umc.org.za site, we'll all be doing it together. Um, and so you're invited to be a part of that. Then Sharon is reading for us this morning. She's reading from Mark chapter 9. Morning. Reading from Mark 9, verses 2 to 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and led them up a high mountain where they were alone. As they looked on, a change came over Jesus, and his clothes became shining white, whiter than anyone in the world could wash them. Then the three disciples saw Elijah and Moses talking with Jesus. Peter spoke up and said to Jesus, Teacher, how good it is that we are here. We will make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He and the others were so frightened that he did not know what to say. Then a cloud appeared and covered them with its shadow, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my own dear son. Listen to him. They took a quick look round, but did not see anyone else. Only Jesus was with them. As they came down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has risen from death. I started reading a novel this week. It's the second in a series about a Canadian homicide detective, Inspector Armand Gamache. And there's an unusual scene early in the novel where one of the main characters, who is an artist named Clara, is attending some public event and she's about to leave. But as she, as she prepares to go, she feels compelled to go and buy some food for a homeless lady that she saw um, earlier on in the evening and who she'd been dismissive of. She felt her conscience pricked and so she goes off to get some food and on the way to find this lady somewhere in the center where they're meeting, she runs into a, an acquaintance who viciously insults Clara's artistic ability, is really mean to her and Clara uh, bursts into tears. Um, in this tearful state she's trying to find this homeless lady and she wanders around and eventually tracks her down huddled up against a wall and hands over the food to her. The lady, whom Clara has never laid eyes on before, looks up at her and looks her straight in the eye and says to her, I have always loved your art, Clara. It's a strange, bizarre moment and one which defies any logical explanation. The, the, the homeless lady wasn't a witness to that earlier conversation and Clara doesn't know her at all. But in the moment, Clara immediately identifies this as a God moment. She believes that God is speaking to her through this homeless lady. She goes home and she tells her husband, who is not, not convinced, and he's uh, a bit skeptical, much less willing to call this a God moment, and he's searching for alternative rational explanations. But for Clara, the only way that she can make sense of this moment is to say that this has been an encounter with God. It doesn't make sense. Uh, what took place in that conversation can't easily be explained. But what she holds on to is the reality of an encounter with God in that moment. And I think the, the gospel passage today, the, the reading that Sharon read for us, has, has something of that in it as well. The events that take place in that passage defy any rational explanation, don't they? Mark tells us that Jesus invites three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, and they go up a mountain together. And as they come up the mountain, Jesus begins to shine with the glory of God. And then he has a conversation with two key historical figures in Jewish history. Uh, Moses, who some say represents the law, and Elijah, 
uh, who may represent the, the great prophets of Israel. Conversation with these two men who are long, long gone. And then finally, a cloud descends over the whole gathering, and the voice of God is heard affirming the identity and the authority of Jesus. An unreal experience. The kind of experience that Clara's husband would have difficulty taking on board. It's not a rational experience. Something, something that is difficult to, to explain and describe. But what is very clear is whatever actually took place in that moment, whatever, the, whatever shape and specific detail um, uh, described that experience, there was a real encounter between God and those disciples. And that was what they experienced. They may struggle to explain it in hindsight, but there was a real encounter with God. And so by all means, we can sit and wrestle with the details of this text. And we should. We should grapple with it and try and make sense of it as best we can. But we also need to recognize that when reading a passage like this and bringing our rational brains to this experience, we're going to get caught up in all sorts of details. We're going to get caught up with questions like, is this passage meant to be read literally? Or is it included in the Gospels to make a theological point about the identity and the authority of Jesus? Why is this passage in our Bibles? Um, we might grapple with, with details like, how did the disciples know that those two figures were Moses and Elijah? Or were Moses and Elijah actually physically present, or was there some kind of vision that the disciples experienced? And if so, did they all experience the same vision simultaneously? We could get lost down this rabbit hole of trying to unpack what's actually going on in this experience. And if you enjoy a good discussion and a debate, um, that may be quite stimulating. But probably what would happen is we would go around in circles and eventually settle on some a version of what we think actually transpired on that day, without actually knowing entirely for sure. And what would happen is that those questions and that discussion would draw us away and distract us from the invitation of this text and the profound reality of this encounter with God. So significant was this moment for Peter, we know this much, that he was still talking about it years later. Whatever happened on that mountain so changed and impacted him that years later he writes this in 2 Peter 1, verse 16 to 18. We have not depended on made-up stories in making known to you the mighty coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. With our own eyes we saw his greatness. We were there when he was given honor and glory by God the Father, when the voice came to him from the supreme glory, saying, this is my own dear Son, with whom I am pleased. We ourselves heard this voice coming from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So a profound moment for Peter and the other two. As we come to this passage then, we're not going to get lost in the details of how it all unraveled and how exactly it took place. What we are going to be doing is listening for the invitation of God and trying to avoid the, uh, the distractions of a heated discussion. We are keeping our focus on the central experience that took place on that day, when those disciples went up a mountain, encountered God in a way that their eyes were open to new truth about Jesus, and then came down that mountain, changed by that encounter. This passage begins with that simple invitation from Jesus to three of his friends. Come with me, he says to them. Come up the mountain with me. And the whole narrative depends on how they respond to that invitation. Without that active step, active response from Peter, James, and John, the story ends there, right there. Come up the mountain, Jesus says to them. Now, this passage is describing a unique moment in the Gospels. Um, it's the moment when Jesus begins to try and explain to his disciples that his glory will not be a throne in Rome, but instead a, a cross outside of Jerusalem. And that is why this passage is used in our 
in our lectionary cycle as the hinge between these two seasons, between the season of Epiphany, when our eyes are being opened to the reality of who God is and what God is like, and the season of, of Lent as we begin to journey to the cross. There comes this moment right in the, in, in the middle, the hinge, uh, the Sunday of Transfiguration. So it's a unique moment in the Gospels. But despite the fact that it speaks to that historical moment, it also speaks into our journey, the journey that you and I take, our journey of faith in the presence of God. And so there is also an invitation for you and me this morning, not just to those three disciples. That same simple invitation that they heard to come up the mountain with Jesus, to take an active part in the story. Remember a few weeks ago, I spoke about how the people of Israel were reluctant to take an active part in the story. They were reluctant when they were invited to go up the mountain with Moses. And Moses said, come up with me, come and stand with me in the presence of God in that moment on Mount Sinai when the law had been given. But they were too scared. And with reason, uh, there was smoke and fire on the mountain and, and the earth was shaking. And so they said to Moses, you go, uh, you go and speak to God and you tell us what he said. And they, they settle on hearing from God through an intermediary, which is tragic, as we said. The invitation was offered to them, come up the mountain, and they said, no, thank you. So there may be smoke on the mountain, and it may be an unnerving prospect to go into the presence of God on our own, as Moses did, as the disciples did. But the invitation is there for you and me. How will we respond? In the uh, wonderful book written by C.S. Lewis, children's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the four children um, who are the central characters come into the land of Narnia, this magical land where many of the animals can speak. And they're hearing a story told to them by a talking beaver, a story about Aslan, who is the king of Narnia, the Christ figure in the story. And they're listening enthusiastically to this wonderful account of this uh, king named Aslan, until suddenly they realize that in fact Aslan is a lion. And this is what the beaver says to them. Aslan is a lion. The lion. The great lion. Ooh, says Susan. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. It's a wonderful uh, dimension of Aslan's character all the way through the Narnia books, that he is good and he is trustworthy, but he's not safe. He's not a tame lion, is the phrase that they frequently use. And so the disciples are invited to go up the mountain with this um, kind of unnerving uh, experience in the presence of God ahead of them, not knowing that it will come, of course, and not knowing whether it is safe or not. They go. Now, on the mountain, when Jesus is transfigured before Peter, James, and John, it is a frightening moment for the disciples. Just like that moment when they were all together in the boat, and the storm rose up, and, and Jesus stands up and commands the wind and the, wave, the waves to be still. And the disciples find themselves asking, Who is this man? Only this time, with all that's going on on top of the mountain, they don't even need to verbalize the question because the answer is so clear before them. Jesus is glorified before the disciples and his identity is affirmed by the voice from the cloud. And then the disciples manage to overcome their fear and they realize that they're quite safe in the presence of God and they will not be harmed. In fact, they discover that it is wonderful to be in this place, to be on top of the mountain. And so Peter comes up with a suggestion that they should build shelters so that they can stay up there for as long as is possible. Not a great idea. And if you notice, um, everybody just ignores Peter's suggestion and carries on as if he hasn't said anything at all in the passage. Because wonderful as it is to be on top of the mountain, wonderful as the mountaintop experience is for us and was for the disciples, we can't stay there. 
We don't live on the mountain. We live in the valley. And the work of Jesus, his saving work, his teaching work, his healing work, takes place in the valley. That's, that's where we have to live. Now, we may live in the valley, uh, but the time on the mountaintop is still important. In this story, the mountaintop is a place of transformation. There's a sense in which Jesus has changed. He is transfigured. And the disciples certainly are changed by this moment. It is something that they will never forget. And they will carry it in, into the future. It's an experience that will bear fruit for years to come. They will look back on it again and again. Maybe you can remember an experience that feels to you something like this. An experience um, on top of the mountain. The details will vary, but a moment where it felt to you like you were in the presence of God. A glorious moment that changed you and maybe strengthened you for what was waiting for you down in the valley. And then, having led the disciples up the mountain, Jesus leads them back down again into the valley. And they take the gift of that time together in the presence of God with them back into daily life. And we go into the valley. Apparently, the great violinist Niccolo Paganini um, had a superb violin that he left in his will to the city of his birth, Genoa. But the condition of the, of the, in, in the will was that it never be played. So he left it to his, his home city. And it was an unfortunate condition because it is a typical of wood that when it is well used, regularly used, it doesn't show any wear and tear. But as soon as it is put to one side, it begins to decay. And so Paganini's exquisite mellow-toned violin has become worm-eaten in its beautiful case, valueless except as a relic. The mouldering instrument is a reminder that a life withdrawn from all service to others loses its meaning. It's a picture of what happens when we insist on staying on the mountain and refuse to come back down into the valley. And that Paganini's violin reminds us why it is that we need to come back into the valley with what we have found on top of the mountain. Debbie Thomas gives us another perspective though. And she's uncomfortable with this distinction between going up onto mountaintops and coming back down into the valley. Uh, she says the following, this is what she writes. One of my problems with, one, one of the problems with my God on the mountaintop version of Christianity is that it prompts me to carve up and compartmentalize my life, to separate sacred from secular, the mountain from the valley, the spectacular from the mundane, as if God is somehow more present during a rousing worship service, a stirring sermon, or a silent retreat in a seaside monastery than God is when I'm doing the laundry, returning a library book, or driving my son to his friend's house. The work of discernment is harder and messier in everyday life. Yes, I have to look for God, minus blinding lights and roaring thunder, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. The God of the whisper is still God. That's a helpful thought to hold on to. Despite the value of the experience on the mountaintop and the presence of God, the sense that God is present with us in the valley too and continues to speak. I want to, as a practical way of wrapping all of this up, and as we head into Lent, leave you with two invitations, something that maybe you can try during this 40-day Lenten period as we prepare for Easter. And the first is to respond to that invitation of Jesus to come up the mountain. And what I mean by that is to draw apart each day through this period of 40 days and spend time with Christ on the mountain. And what you do with that time is up to you. Um, there's a range of things you could try. You may want to read scripture reflectively and just sit in quiet as you, as you um, meditate on the words or use a devotional book, maybe like the, the uh, Lenten book that um, uh, we've been advertising. You may want to walk 
and imagine that Jesus is walking alongside you. Maybe have a conversation as you walk. You may want to experiment with silence or with centering prayer, whatever. For me, my practice over the last uh, number of weeks has been to make a cup of tea and to walk out of the house and go down the road to a rugby field just down the way and sit on the stands on the side of the field for half an hour or so. And sometimes I will read from scripture, sometimes I'll just sit quietly, um, sometimes I will talk with God. But whatever it may look like, to, to carve out that time on the mountain and to respond to the invitation when Jesus says, come with me, come up the mountain with me. And then at the end of that time to walk down the mountain and to come back into the valley. So that's the first thing. The second practice is in the valley and involves other people. To make a deliberate commitment during this period of Lent to connect with a group or maybe just with another individual if you prefer on a weekly basis, at least once a week, to meet in a group or with another. You can join with one of the home groups or you can uh, form a new group, um, whatever form that takes, or connect with an individual. And um, very simply, talk through with the group or with the individual what life in the valley is like for you at the moment, what you're experiencing, what's going on in your life. And uh, you may also, if, you, if you're comfortable, you may want to share something of what you're discovering on the mountaintop. Uh, what's been happening when you've spent time alone with Christ on the mountaintop. But really the idea is to connect and to share life with a group or with individuals. Those two practices then. And then, um, as, a, as a community, uh, one, one further thing, this is, uh, this, is not, this is just an invitation to come and be part of something uh, in a bigger group, on a Thursday evening, and uh, not this Thursday, but starting um, after the first Sunday of Lent, in that first week, to meet at 7.30 online, and um, there'll be details explaining how you do that. We've got a, a function on our website that makes that possible, and many of our home groups are using that already. But to come along at 7.30 on a Thursday evening for an informal community time, and I will convene it, and I, and I might uh, share some brief thought with you in that time but in that gathering you're in, you're invited if you like you don't have to say anything you can just sit quietly too but you're invited to bring a question to ask there may have been something that came out of your your home group time <clears throat> or your conversation with somebody else a question that you can throw at me and uh, we can we can grapple with together as a group or it may be um, something that you want to share something that's happened in the week um, that we can we can share in together as a group. And so you're welcome to sit quietly. No one's going to force you to say anything. But you're all invited to come and be a part of that. A Thursday evening um, from, from 7.30 and there'll be details uh, uh, sent, sent out close to the time. <clears throat> so, as we head into this new season, this sacred season of Lent, May you be open to the invitation of Jesus to come up the mountain and to encounter God and to take an active, to play an active part in the story. And may that experience, whatever it may look like, whether there is bright shining light or not, may that experience equip you for life in community in the valley. Amen. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this simple invitation that we hear today to come and be with you up on the mountain, to encounter you in your glory in whatever way we experience that, to know the reality of an encounter with you. And then, strengthened by that, to take that experience into the valley. We pray that during the coming uh, period of Lent, these 40 days from Wednesday, uh, we will draw closer to you and we will hear you speaking to us in different ways. We will also be drawn closer to each other in community as we prepare for worship in this holiest of seasons. So we invite you to come, Lord, and to accompany us back into the valley, into our communities, our families, to be present and to help us as we seek to live as your people in this world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
look inside the mystery See the empty cross See the risen Savior Victorious and strong No one else above Him None is strong to save So bless you in the coming week and um, 
Don't forget the service on Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock, the Ash Wednesday service. And if you want to participate in the ashing and in the communion, you can have those elements prepared. But you're also welcome to just come and be a part of the service. It's entirely up to you. And then uh, we'll be talking more about how we journey together in community through this period of Lent, going up the mountain and sharing that experience with others and uh, on a Thursday evening from that following week. We're going to close the service now with a benediction based on our gospel passage today. Not all is as it seems. There is a glory hidden in everything, waiting to be revealed to the eyes of those who believe beyond what seems inevitable, who do not want to live in the status quo, but in the promises of God. Hold on to the vision as we turn towards Lent and walk the more difficult path there is yet a greater glory still to be revealed. Go in peace, go in hope, go in love. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Grace and peace. Grace and